write about it. <laughs> and so, when the Holy Spirit's light shines in the mind, which reminds you, you are not unique, special, important. You're Holy Son of God. <laughs> you are magnitude beyond, you know, beyond any of this. The mind kind of like the whole world, all the all the layers and the whole, uh, you know, space center just start to shake and collapse a little. And so the mind projects the guilt out onto the body as a, to call forth a witness to prove that it's right, you know, because it, it projects it out in the body and it says, see God, I'm weak, I'm frail, I'm little, and I've got the flu now. I can't be the Holy Son of God. And it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. It's not my fault? The germ did it to me. I, I even had my flu shot, you know. But you, but you see, you see what's going on there. You can see the dynamics that goes on here. It's why the mind, it's insane, admittedly. You know, people will say to me, who in their right mind would choose sickness, you know? No. Yes. Who in their right mind? Ah, it's the key. We're back to the levels again. If you're in your right mind, if you're if you're staying up in the abstractness and staying with the Holy Spirit, you're above the world and the body. You don't see the body as causative. Aren't you saying, okay, that, you know, sickness and, and dying, okay, is the ego's, how the ego perceives it. These backward thoughts are up, upside down, okay, ideas are actually right side up and, and, and straight forward. Yeah. I mean, forward thoughts, kind of, I would say, it's just kind of like the Holy Spirit teaches that the mind is causative, and so that you can extend forgiveness. You can share the ideas of the Course, literally. I mean, that's a, that's a forward kind of a thing, an extension that I see as moving forward. So that, um, it's kind of like uh, you may get together with somebody, and, and Jesus calls it like false empathy and true empathy. Through the ego, we're used to empathizing with people going, oh, you poor baby, and you poor thing, and that's supposed to be loving and comforting and concerning, and Jesus is saying, wait a minute, you know, don't, don't share those kind of ideas, you poor thing. <laughs> those are backward thoughts. But th there is a way where we line with the Holy Spirit where we can, we can just hold with that, we can remind the patient in our minds that they're whole and complete, even if there's nothing we can say that we're to say with our mouth. Or there may be something that we can share an experience or share an idea that the Spirit will speak through us that will be a kind of a different way of looking at it, you know. So that's kind of how I look at backwards and forwards. Is it's a kind of an extension or a sharing of our real thoughts or the thoughts in the Course of Miracles. I've got an example. A friend of mine then, she said, I really have been sick and I'm going to go to the doctor. I think I have chronic fatigue syndrome. And without even thinking, I said, because she's a science of mind woman, I said, it's absolutely impossible that you have chronic fatigue syndrome. Do not go to the doctor. You know it's impossible. It's all right not to go to work. It's all right to stay home. You don't. It's okay to be lazy. Don't get sick as an excuse. It's impossible you have this. I wasn't even thinking. I wasn't even thinking. It just came out. I wish people would do that. To my. I want to project people doing that to me. Like <laughs> they said, oh, you poor thing. I know how you feel exactly. And I get sicker and sicker. <laughs> of course, as it takes what two people to agree that you're separate before you can get sick. It only takes one to see you whole to take care of you. Yeah, really. and the mind watching when you, and we're the one. I mean, that yeah. yeah. really comes yeah. down to that. The proceeding calls for help, and we can't really teach salvation. We can't extend the ideas of the Course until we believe them ourselves. You know, that's why it takes a real convincing. But but the more you really follow Jesus' logic and reasoning, you know, you really stay with him in the Course. It's by golly, it's sound. I mean, it's just every way he comes at the very same thing. It's it's really cross sound. Him up, can't okay, you? here's a little one. This just that uh, it's funny you said what you said because you know about saying, Oh, it's too bad. <laughs> My husband had something in his mouth today, he was chewing something and he went out the door and his pocket on his coat caught on the doorknob and it jerked him back and he bit his tongue and he Wah! Yeah, I mean he made this horrible noise. He takes pain real well. <laughs> and I said, What happened? And he says, I bit my tongue. And I said, Oh, I'm sorry, you bit your tongue, you know. So, but then I went over to him on him and I asked the Holy Spirit. So you don't make you feel better. Now, what really happened? Was he, did he cause himself to bite his tongue? I mean this isn't an illness, but this is a accident if you want to about Was he doing some backward thinking that made it happen and then did I verify that by Sympathizing with you? Well, as soon as we ask the question about 
what he did. I mean, that's not, when we get back to that, it's all over my lesson kind of thing. Okay. It always comes back to our own perception. And really, so it's always my lesson, it's always my perception, and it even gets simpler than that, is that there's only, the Holy Spirit perceives only two orders of thought. Everything to do with love or call for love, you know? So it's kind of like just staying back in, in your mind that, that you know when, when there's a call for love, but you know, it, it sounds like you were quick to recognize that and quick to... Uh, yeah. To, to ask call for love every day. Yeah. 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 And, and the only thing that blocks, it's like the Holy Spirit always sees everything as love or a call for love. And he says, and wouldn't you answer a call for love with love? I mean, yeah. wouldn't you share it if you could perceive it that way? See, the main thing, once again, it gets back into our perception. If there's only love and a call for love, then we'd be in good shape. But the ego says, wait a minute, we got another alternative over here. Attack. <laughs> you know, whether I'm being attacked or somebody else is attacking me, or I'm attacking somebody else. And, and ultimately, the Course is teaching us that this is not a, a real option, that attack is not real, that these attack thoughts in our mind are not from the Holy Spirit, they are from God, and they are real. So you can see if we give up attack thoughts, then we'll cease to start to judge things as attacks. <coughs> we'll just see everything as love and a call for love. Another way, too, is um, it's this form content thing. It, it can seem like with form, it can seem so um, confusing at times mm -hmm. because there's so many different forms. There's this myriad of images. But behind all the images is only the, the love and the call for love. And I think that's why the more you study the Course and the more you really get anchored in the thought system, that you, you don't get fooled by the when he talks about healing. And he asked the question, you know, the question is asked to Jesus, should healing be repeated? You know? And he's saying, <laughs> no, you know, no. we've just said that healing is certain. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So healing should not be repeated. If you have continued concern for the patient based on symptoms that still may seem to be there and everything, you need healing. <laughs> You're the patient now. <laughs> because you see, well, it gets back to our question about continuing symptoms. If, if we ask the Holy Spirit and we give it over and we see them as whole, and then we're, we keep looking back and checking on how they're doing or if they're recovering or whatever, you know, did we really give it over to the Holy Spirit? Or are we still concerned? Or, and you can see we're, we're the patient then. So. It's probably part of our false belief system, too, to think that death is not wholeness, isn't it? That death is not wholeness? Uh, yeah, the thing about death is is that we, we're, once again, we're, we get tied up on the screen. And, and we believe that death is death of bodies, right? Animals die, you know, people die, and bodies die. And we define death at the, at the form level, I and mean, that's what death is. Or we call it transition. Somebody's made their transition and this and that. Where'd they go? I mean, you know, <laughs> where is there to go? I mean, where place is a concept in the mind, you know? It's, it's a real different. When you really get into the deeper realm of the Course, instead of thinking of souls that come into bodies and little babies and go away and come in and go away, you know, it's almost like instead it's like you're just the mind and you're watching a movie screen, you know? And as long as you believe in idols, you're going to continue to see the movie screen. And when you completely give up all the idols, the channels, I mean, this sets off. That's the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's a different kind of perspective than, than thinking that you know, this discusses reincarnation in the manual and so on and so forth. It's kind of like, if, if you think about the perspective of souls coming into a little baby and then leaving when, when you die, it's, it's kind of funny. A soul is supposed to be immortal, right? And infinite from God. And how does a soul fit into a little teeny slab of flesh? You know, isn't it, doesn't it strike you as a little bit funny that something that's changeless, that's supposed to be immortal and infinite, comes into something that's finite and tiny? I mean, you know, just after a while you start to say, well, that's been a belief that's been very helpful to me. I mean, I, I believe in reincarnation in my path, and it helped me have a sense that nobody, God didn't turn anyone away and that everybody makes it back. But when you start to get into the Course, I mean, even some of those concepts, you start to have these experiences, and those start to start to fall away a little bit, because you start to say, "Well, that's kind of silly to think of it like that way." And what Jesus does is he com he takes something like death, which we've already talked about, as defined in the body. And if you if you read like lessons 163 and 167, they're great. <coughs> Jesus defines death in in literally psychological terms. He says if you have a minor twinge of annoyance, 
if you're a little miffed off, if you have any kind of pain, hatred, anger, jealousy, envy, my golly, he just rattles off all these different things and he says, death. <laughs> they're all death. They're all just praise from fear. Now that's, I don't know about you, but that's a, a little bit defi different definition than what I grew up with. My, my definition of death was somebody going six feet under. So, once again, we're back to the mind watching. If if I've got all these backward thoughts, and those are thoughts of death, and all of my upsetting emotions, depression, anxiety, fear, a thumbnail, a hangnail that's bothering me, whatever it is, pain, all those spring from, from the ego thought system, then it's, it simplifies that death is simply the ego. And, and all we have to do is let go and see how silly the ego is, and that's how we transcend death. You know, be, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world is, is just another translation for, you know, the ego is silly and false, and it has no power over the Holy Son of God. The Son of God can't die. Well, okay, so here you are in the kitchen, and you're ready to go for a glass of whatever, or a cigarette. What do you do at that moment? And you perceive that as like you're an alcoholic, or you're hooked up cigarettes or whatever. What do you do at that moment? Well, it's kind of like all you can do is ask. I mean, the, what I found in my life when I first started having changes and shifts, it's kind of like, just like an Alcoholics Anonymous, they, you know, they say quit drinking. That can help. Or quit smoking or quit eating or this or that. Whereas, obviously a shift at the symptom level, you know, is not a permanent shift and everything. But it can be very, I think, conducive and helpful. Okay, if you're a candy holic, you know, don't keep walking by the candy store. You know, just just ask for a prayer or ask for some strength, maybe. But but ultimately, it's kind of like um, I would say that's why AA works so well. It's the sense that there's such a fellowship and it's such a kind of getting out of yourself. Call someone up. You know, if you want to get into forgiveness and the purpose of forgiveness, then you 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 want to be used by the Holy Spirit to be of comfort and healing to someone. Boy, is that short circuit the ego. I mean, you know, the, all the feelings of craving a cigarette or craving a, a drug or alcohol or sex or something like that and feeling empty and lonely, you know, if we if we turn our turn within ourselves and we, we identify with this little body identity, you know, that just kind of keeps it going that way. And then we feel like we need the whatever. We feel like we're bound to something physically. But it's like that's why I think AA and, and a lot of those things work. Go out help a friend, visit someone, call someone, or reach out, you know, and call somebody and say, I need to talk, you know, because a lot of times it's easy to just isolate or whatever. And that's, that's probably the, if I had to say one thing, that would be probably the most, most helpful thing you could do. And then as you go along, you get better at watching your, your mind and, and help them. Because of course he's enjoying that creates the feeling. Join with your brother. Yeah. It really is an intention. I mean it's even with joining the ego tries to get in because remember the ego uses special relationships. So it's like join with my brother and then you get into the physical stuff. Um, it can it can go real quick into the physical stuff and then you've got to get something, you know, hey you know, I spent so much time with you, and you're you're, you're not meeting my needs. You, you should be around more. Da da. Uh, it happens with course groups even. I mean, you know, ego will try to get in on anything. The ego will try to make a special relationship with the course group. You know, when you become addicted, I can't go without my course group. I can't miss a meeting. You know, you can. It, it could actually. You can see where the specialness comes in. The course group in itself is nothing, but it's like it becomes part of the self concept. Well, I'm better now because I'm with these special group of people. Yeah. It happens with uh, Course in Miracles conferences. Mm -hmm. You know, oh wow, a national conference. I'll go there and have this big healing event and everything. And the more conferences I can go to, or my friends going to conferences, if only I had enough money that I could go to conferences, then I'd be <laughs> as healing as she is. Or as healing as you can see. <laughs> the ego is going to try to, to use anything in the world of form to latch on to to say that you're not doing it right, or this and that. But once you get wise to its game, you know, I mean, this is our national conference. We're having it right here, this very instant. I mean, you start to see that 
holding this, this purpose of forgiveness is where it's all at. And then, you, then all of a sudden you're not codependent about, um, I'm not in the right place.